Am I on? I don't, there we go. Good morning. It's time to begin. Blue skies and rainbows and sun from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the master. I live for each day. I know Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it is the power that saves us today. I know that Jesus is well alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Good morning. I've got call to worship too. I just want to send a, extend a warm welcome to all of our visitors and those that aren't visitors. I'm glad you're here too. Life is better when, when you are here. I got some really good friends that surprised me and they showed up. I mean, it, they didn't come just for me, but uh, it's great to see them. I got to grow up knowing them as a kid in Mulvane. So Joe and Janet, I love seeing you guys. Uh, but it is great to be here. If, if I read the slides, I get to put together the slideshow a lot of the time. If I read them right, a lot of today is about doing what you're supposed to do in the kingdom. And that's really easy. I love uh, in, in the Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1, 26 and 27, it says, Brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Know your calling. And, and that's a big deal. We all have a role, and sometimes we're not comfortable in our role, and yet it is still our calling. It's something that we grow into. God loves to see his children grow and become what he created us to be. We're not all there yet. We're never going to be there, but we continue to grow in what we are called to do. As we get to worship together, we get to worship together as a family that serves in the same kingdom together in unity, and that's, that's pretty neat. That being said, today we've got a couple different camp songs that are in, so if you know those songs, if you're familiar with them, please sing out for, for those songs. It'll, it'll just make everything better. And, and we've even got a request. So if I'm leading songs for sure, uh, if you've got something we haven't sang for a while, and I know it and want to lead it, I'll be happy to lead that as well. But uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started with the, with the service. Holy God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your son who conquered death and gave us hope of resurrection. Uh, just please be with us today as we worship. Allow us to do so in wor uh, spirit and truth. And allow us to do so that edifies and builds each other. In Jesus' name, amen. One other announcement. Typically we do a lot of fun stuff on Wednesday nights with the youth group. That's not the case. 
As you might have seen the slide, some old guy from Mulvane, Steve Carden, my dad, is going to be here preaching, and so youth group will be in here on Wednesday. So, and we'll begin. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I might fall. Give me the strength to hear your call. Oh, may my steps be worship and may my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. Faith is the race to conquer death, is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in him. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. Will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming, Lord come quick.
Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start by reading Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper, found in uh, Matthew chapter 26. After I finish reading, after we take the Lord's Supper, I, I want to uh, turn to John chapter 6 and, and read a earlier account in Jesus' life where he explains the meaning of the bread that we take in the Lord's Supper. So we're in Matthew chapter 26, verse uh, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Would you all pray with me at this time? Father, as we honor Jesus, as he instructed us to, we take this bread, remembering that it represents his body that he gave as a sacrifice for us. That, Father, uh, not only did he give his life by dying for us on the cross, but he gave us his whole life to bringing you to us and helping us to understand you and teaching teaching us about you and uh, we rejoice that he rose from the grave that he conquered sin and death and and uh, that he conquered satan and and uh, because of jesus we can look forward to being in heaven with you in jesus name amen Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew from anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, as we take this cup, we remember that it represents the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross, and that uh, by his blood uh, we find forgiveness. It washes over us and purifies us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the, uh, makes us pure and clean in your sight, uh, that when you look at us, you see no sin, and you see us as pure and blameless, and, with, and uh, it prepares a way for us to get to heaven. Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to turn to John chapter 6. Uh, start with verse 27. Where Jesus explains to us at an earlier time in his ministry what it means that he's the bread of life. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God required? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then? Will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come for, to me, and whoever comes to me 
it will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, that raised them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus explained that, well, if we, we're going to eat again, and, and we'll go hungry again. We, we took the, the Lord's Supper, the bread and juice. This, this didn't fill us up. And, and we, we, we'll get full at dinner time, but then we'll get hungry again. This, we need to work for that food that is completely satisfying, the food that, that Jesus Christ offers us. Uh, we need to study his life, his miracles, his teachings. We need to fill up on Jesus. He, he gives us the, the, true, the food, the spiritual food that's truly satisfying. And, and the, 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 he quenches our thirst. He gives us the drink that is that we will never go thirsty again. Now, with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, have a prayer for the, for the collection. Uh, Father, I just want to give thanks for all the blessings you bestow on us and how you look after us. And you give us this opportunity to, to share what you have given us, to use it for your glory, to uh, make friends here on earth that we can keep with us as we go to heaven. We pray that you guide the use of this money collected, uh, use it for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song to praise him all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And we'll make sure. Children, if you want to make your way up to the front, it is time for children's worship. Come on right up to the stage. And we'll have some worship. Well, JJ's not here, Mr. Corbin's not here, so I think you're stuck with me. All right, you guys got any lights? We have lights? 
All right, you guys, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine, hide it under a bush, oh, no, I'm going to let it shine, hide it under a bushel, oh, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine, don't let the devil it out, I'm going to let it shine, don't let the devil it out, I'm going to let it shine, don't let the devil it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. Shine all over Hutchinson, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all over Hutchinson, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all over Hutchinson, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me tells me so. Are you guys ready for Bible Hour? All right, let's go to Bible Hour. Jesus loves to live. Well, I'm sorry. It's just a little talk with Jesus, not our God. He is alive. So if you would stand for this song, and we'll get ready for Wayne's sermon. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It paid my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by it. Now when you feel a little prayer for you. As your heart in heaven is turned, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mists of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by him. Now when you feel a little prayer for yearn, as your heart into heaven is turned, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, and he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by him. Now when you feel a little prayer for you, as your heart is you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. 
Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by him. Now when you feel a little prayer for you, as your heart in heaven is turned, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Please be seated. Luke 19, 1 through 10. <clears throat> Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Good morning, Eastwood family. It's a fun time of the year. We've got a lot of guests and uh, visitors with us, and I know uh, many of our members are traveling as we're kind of finishing up our summer, but glad that you're here. If you're a guest and a visitor, man, stick around. We want to have opportunity to introduce ourselves. But wasn't that amazing seeing how many young people that we had up here this morning? I, I was counting. There was probably 20. That might have been one of our largest children worship time, and so just love seeing that, uh, that happen. So thank you, uh, parents for supporting your kids on coming up here. You know, uh, every week, every day, perhaps, potentially, we have the opportunity to run into all kinds of different people. Now, sometimes we're going to run into some, what the world might say are minor individuals. Well, have you ever asked yourself, well, what moves somebody from being a minor individual in my life to someone that plays a major role? Wouldn't it have something to do as if I slowed down for a few minutes and I took the opportunity to look that individual in the eye, kind of like as Jesus was looking up to Zacchaeus there in the tree, and have a conversation with them and start interacting with them and, and, and reminded myself that they too are created in the image of God and, and I need to do everything that I can to have a good and wholesome and healthy relationship with that person. Today we're going to be turning to the book of Acts as we're going to continue our Acts study this morning. We're going to see somebody that the apostles take a moment of time to stop, to look him in the eye, and to reach out their hand in the name of Jesus and help that individual. So if you have your Bibles handy this morning, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And I put up on the big screen, you know, the Christian community, the church, it begins to thrive when members see the legitimate needs of others that are around them. Start following along as I read in Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man was there, was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple court. Now when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So the need of this person is quite extreme. 
on a daily basis, he is taken to the temple. In that area where he has to be carried so that he can beg. Now he has a couple things against him. Number one is the theology of the people around him for why he is in the circumstance that he is. Do you remember in John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Jesus' own uh, disciples ask, you know, what did, you know, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because that was a common theology that, 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 that they had in that time. That literally in their utero, he could have sinned, or perhaps his parents sinned. That's why he was born blind. Jesus had to remind them, no. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in his life. But here's the second thing that uh, he did not have going for him. He was over 40 years old. Chapter 4, verse 22 will tell us that. So he had been with this dis disability, this paralysis, all of his life. That's a long time. Thinking about, you know, 40 plus years old in the first century Bible times, we forget. You know, the average lifespan here in America in 1900 was only 47 years. And so he had been living a, a fairly old, long life with this disability. Now he's brought to the temple. Perhaps he thought, you know, this is a good spot for a person like me to try to get some help from others. One, perhaps he was hoping that they'd feel guilty enough that they might break down and help him. Because oftentimes, as you study human psychology, we do things for others just because we feel guilty about it, or we feel guilty if we didn't help. But perhaps he was looking for a more noble purpose. See, people are going to pray uh, for a time of prayer. Perhaps because of their love of God, their obedience to God's word that talks about helping out widows and orphans and people that are poor or disabled or foreigners, perhaps out of their devotion to God and their care to love their neighbor as themselves might motivate them to help me out financially. Now notice Peter and John's response to this man as they see him. Picking up in verse 4, Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. So both Peter and John as they're making their way to the temple, they're going for a time of prayer. It is a time of worship. They were busy. They had a place to go. But they see this man that's in need, and they stop. And he looks at them, and they look at him. Focus on, look at us. And the man's expecting to perhaps get some help from them. That's interesting. Here's a, uh, a young man that wrote a book a few years back. It was called Under the Overpass, A Journey of Faith on the Streets of America by a young guy by the name of Mike Yanikowski. Mike Yanikowski at, uh, is writing about experience that he had when he was in college. Just a handsome young guy. He was going to college there in California. He comes from an upper middle class family. But he really wanted to put his faith to the test. And he wanted to make sure that he could live by Christian principles. And he made an agreement with a good friend of his named Sam and that they would live like homeless people and travel the, or travel the U.S. for about five months. And so they would kind of truly experience what life would be like to live homeless in America. And they went to about six different cities, all the way from San Diego to Washington, D.C., and so here this young, affluent, talented, good-looking, college-age student now transform in his words to somebody that is kind of the, the scum of the earth, a homeless person, and somebody that folks in society try to ignore and move past. Now, he said one of the tragedies that he had is as he transformed from this college student to this person living on the streets is that he said people don't look at you anymore they begin to ignore you but he said there was a group that even in his most desperate of state dirty smelly hungry long hair beard growing he said there was a group of people that would continue to look at him and make eye contact with him at the end of today's lesson i'll point out uh, more clearly who that was but let's see how divine power 
will come into the equation. Let me read verses 6 to 10 for you. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus of Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them and the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate, called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Divine power always meets the human need. Now, Peter shared with them, silver and gold I don't have, but here's what I do have. In the name of Jesus, he grabbed that man by the hand, he said, walk, and he yanked him up, and that man who had been paralyzed all of his life, imagine his atrophied legs and muscles and how his ankles had not been strong, all of a sudden is immediately healed to the point that he's jumping up and down, leaping and jumping and holding on to Peter and John and praising God and all the people that were around there were in absolute amazement. For four decades this man has been paralyzed. We've been bringing him here to the temple gate and now he can walk, he's healed, and he's jumping up and down. Now imagine what it would be like living all of your life with a disability, a very severe and profound disability, and all of a sudden you were healed. I want to show you a video of a 29-year-old young lady by the name of Sloane Cherman. She's been deaf all of her life, but now she's going to have the opportunity to hear with the aid of a cochlear ear implant. It's only about a minute and a half video, but I'd like for you to walk, uh, watch it with me here this morning and notice her emotional response from hearing for the very first time in her life. It's like so cool. <laughs> amazing. And it chokes me up every time that I watch that video, and I've watched it a bunch of times. But just thinking of the motions that she had behind her life. She's only 29 years old, but all she's ever known is not being able to hear and reading people's lips and, and all of that. And now she can actually hear. And the joy, those were happy tears that she had. But now let's get into the shoes of this fellow that had been over 40 years old. He's able to walk for the first time. So in 40 years, no more are people going to look down on me. No more am I going to be seen as that one that is the disabled one. No longer are people perhaps not going to make eye contact with me. Now I am healed. Imagine the joy and the excitement and the praise to God that just flowed out of this man that had been healed. Now I also believe that the Christian community thrives 
when we give credit to where credit is due. Let's continue our reading here in Acts chapter 3. Now, let me focus on verses 11 through 16. Now, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, and they came running to them in the place of Solomon's colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power, God in us, we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this, and by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, evidently, they were doing what people often do when something amazing happens. But oftentimes, they look to the messenger or to the worker Versus giving praise and credit to the one that truly ought to receive the glory and the praise. Didn't Jesus say, apart from me, you can do nothing in John 15 and verse 5? The lame man had it right. He was leaping and walking and he was praising God for his healing. We need to give credit to where credit is due. And that's what a thriving faith community, that's what a thriving church will do. We'll give credit to God. Didn't Paul write in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And didn't Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So when something good goes on in your life and you have an accomplishment, you have a breakthrough, you're able to see something really happen, what's your response? Is it, you know... Joe, you just did pretty good here. You really knocked this one out of the park. Or do you thank God for the gift that he's given you, the door of opportunity that he's opened up, the talent, the ability, or the opportunity to learn certain skills in life? Do you give credit to God, or do you give credit back to yourself or to man? See, the, the faith community that's thriving gives credit where credit truly is due, and that is credit to God. But here's a third point I'd like to make this morning. The Christian community thrives when members respond to adversity with great boldness. Turn with me now to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here we read the priests. And the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming to Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard that message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So you have three primary characters here. Number one, we have the priests, the Jewish priests, those that are serving there in the temple. Number two, we have the, the, the captain of the temple guard. He was kind of like the chief of police down at the temple, making sure that things were being done and right and orderly and people were abiding by the law down there. Then thirdly, you have that religious party, the Sadducees, that had a great influence on the priesthood. In fact, they were in charge of the high priest. They had some unusual theological beliefs that they did not believe in angels. They did not believe in spirits. They did not believe that there was an afterlife, and they did, obviously did not believe in a resurrection from the dead. So they have Peter and John arrested. There's a lot of firsts that we read about. In the book of Acts, in the opening pages, these opening chapters, we have the first uh, gospel sermon. We have the first church there in Jerusalem, and now we have the first evidence of persecution that comes against the followers of Jesus. Why did they arrest them? Well, they're teaching down in the temple court. That was, you know, kind of exclusive area for the priest to be teaching, 
for elders or perhaps rabbis, uh, trusted rabbis doing some teaching down in that area. Not these apostles, not these visitors from Galilee. They weren't supposed to be doing that. And that secondly, they were concerned about what they were teaching. They were talking about the resurrection from the dead, that Jesus had been raised back to life. And so that was an affront to these Sadducees that were uh, in charge and in place of influence. So let's see what happens now in verses 5 through 13. Notice, first of all, this boldness that Peter and John have. have. It will continue to grow as it's unveiled here in verses 5 through 13. Chapter 4. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, we're being called on account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is a stone you builders rejected, which has become a cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So as Peter and John go before the Jewish Sanhedrin, some of the most powerful intellectual, intellectual minds in all of Israel have gathered together there. I mean, they're brilliant. They're scholars. They're people of authority. They're people of influence. Normally, when somebody was brought before them, they would be shaken with terror, overwhelmed with fear. But not these former fishermen. No, they stand before them, even though, as they observe, these guys are unschooled. They're ordinary men. They don't have lots of letters and degrees behind their name. They haven't been in some famous rabbinical schools or followed after a great, you know, rabbi instructor like Gamaliel or anything. No, these are just common ordinary men. These are just fishermen. They are blown away by their boldness, by their courage, by their, by their ability to articulate the message about Jesus. That's interesting. It wasn't too much earlier than this when a commoner had come from Galilee, somebody that taught with great authority, somebody that could not be bested in a debate, someone who had great compassion, someone who uh, performed great miracles, Jesus himself. These guys observed, wow, we have no other explanation other than these men have been by Jesus. You know, it makes a big difference in our boldness of who we surround ourselves with, who we affiliate with. Peter and John had obviously spent time with Jesus, and it was evident in their life. And so as you continue to turn the pages of the book of Acts, you see great boldness in the church. I mean, they are praying for boldness, chapter 4, verse 29. Their preaching is bold, chapter 4, verse 31. And when they're forced to make a decision, you know, they tell them, who do you think we should obey? Should we obey God or should we obey man? And they chose God every time. So we need to ask ourselves this morning, don't we? Are we bold for our Christian faith? Do our leaders and our teachers and our preachers and, and individual members, do we take the opportunity to be bold? Bold and courageous with our faith. When is the last time, and the finger's pointing back at me just as much to uh, anybody else, when's the last time that we prayed for boldness like these early Christians did? Boldness to preach the word of God. Boldness to stand up for our Christian beliefs, values, and, uh, and convictions. When's the last time we prayed for that? When's the last time that we really took on a ministry that says, God, we need great faith. We need great courage. We need to have great boldness as we enter out into this ministry for you. Peter and John 
played a major role in somebody that society looked like such a minor individual. Why did they do that? They took the time to see a person, to interact with him, and in Jesus' name, do what they could to help that man, the very best of their ability. Every day, I believe each and every one of us has an opportunity to interact with these minor people in society. What are we going to do? Are we going to allow our faith to be bold, courage, and courageous, look them in the eye, and do all that we can in the name of Jesus Christ to help and to serve them? I promise you this, when you do those kinds of things, people are going to notice that you are different. It's going to give you an opportunity. Perhaps they will even notice the things that you're saying, the things that you're doing. That's the things that Jesus did. That's the kind of thing that, as you read in the Bible, that the followers of Jesus did. These folks have been with Jesus. Oh, yeah. I was going to tell you about, you know, Mike Yanikowski when he was writing that book about, you know, living as a homeless person. Who was the last group in society that would still take the time to make eye contact with him? Children. He writes in his book that they were in Washington, D.C. They were playing songs, trying to get some money, and thousands of people are milling around there in the mall there in Washington, D.C. No one's paying any attention to them. A little boy comes up to him and says, you're really hungry, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. The little boy reached into his pocket, pulled out a dollar twenty-five, gave it to him, and uh, said, go get something to eat. Didn't Jesus say, if you want to enter into my kingdom, you need to become like a child? So today, let us all be reminded, we want to thrive as a church, as a Christian community. We need to see others that are kind of invisible, to see others that, that the majority aren't seeing, that we need to give credit to where credit is due, that we need to praise and glorify God whenever we're able to have the opportunity to, to help and to serve others. And let's be courageous and do what God has called for his people to do. We're going to offer an invitation here this morning. Matt's going to lead us in this invitation song. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come as we stand and sing this selected song? You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You gotta take the Lord with you, children, everywhere you go. You've got to love one another, children, everywhere you go. You've got to love one another, children, everywhere you go. You've got to love one another, children, everywhere you go. You've got to preach the word daily, children, everywhere you go. You've got to preach the word daily, children, everywhere you go. You've got to preach the word daily, children, everywhere you go. In the street, in the home, on the job, all alone, highways, byways, highways, byways. We worship a wonderful God, don't we? Would you please pray with me? Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for 
the day's light that you gave us so that we can get up and come and worship you. We love to worship you, O God, because you are a true living God. You are the God that gives us life. Father, we uh, pray that uh, you'll be with uh, the many sick, especially those here in this congregation that uh, are suffering, and uh, please be with them and help them to recover. Father, we have a lot of people suffering from the heat that is outside. You've given us a wonderful morning, but the uh, heat's coming, and uh, we pray that you'll be with us and allow those who have to be out in the heat to protect them and give them plenty of water. And I'm speaking particularly about the, uh, the policemen who have to be out in the heat and the firemen that have to uh, fight the fires, it gives them extra heat. Uh, we ask that you would bless them and please protect them and uh, guide them. And Father, we, uh, we love you with all of our hearts and we thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've allowed to have in our hearts that we can depend on to stay close to you. For the devil's out there seeking whom he may devour. Please help us to turn away from wrongdoing and help us to uh, turn our eyes constantly to you. Bless us now as we go to our own place. Uh, help us to get there safely and uh, uh, bless us each and every day as we seek your will, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to go get your children, please do so now as we sing our closing song, the first verse of A Beautiful Life. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Life's evening sun is sinking low, a few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be no setting sun. You're dismissed. Have a great day.